Sermon writing, it turns out, is an art. And sermon writing, when things happen that you didn't see coming, also becomes pastoral care. It becomes pastoral care for the community of faith that you lead, but also for your neighbors, and many times for yourself. While ministers advise their congregations during Lent to sit back and consider their lives, it is a whirlwind time for us and our staff. So this week in the midst of the whirlwind, the sermon I was writing for today was playing in my mind on a very long video loop, like all sermons tend to do. But that sermon wasn't the sermon that would end up on the page for today. While I'm writing in my office, I talk out loud as the words go on the paper. Then when I'm driving home, I'm preaching to the people in the other cars that are with me. Now granted, they don't know it, but I'm sure it's helping them all the same. The only real danger with preaching in the car is that I use my hands to talk like I do up here, so I've had to learn really to keep one hand on the wheel and only use this other hand. But a sermon that's gelling in a minister's mind and on paper changes when tragedy strikes. It changes when the title of a Lenten sermon series becomes a reality for our family we don't even know thousands of miles away. On our Friday, when I finally, not looking at the news earlier, heard what had happened in New Zealand, I instantly thought of Donald Brown and Chris Parsons, members of our community and of our choir who are on a trip of a lifetime there. I wrote them and asked that they offer prayers from First Church on New Zealand soil. They had stayed two weeks ago at a beautiful hotel in Christchurch directly across from the Dean's Avenue Mosque. Yesterday, they went to the Wellington Anglican Cathedral to meditate, to pray, to reflect for themselves and on our behalf. It is in times like this that we need to remember that we are all made from the same substance. No matter what our beliefs, our nationality, our gender, our race, our sexual orientation and gender identities, we are all made of the dust of this evolving earth and the stardust of the universal womb of God. And while I do believe that being made in the image of God means we are all inherently good, that our essence is divine, I also have to acknowledge that we are capable of great evil. I prefer to think that evil only resides in people like those whose hate brought the massacres at the mosque in Christ Church, at Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, at Mother Emanuel AME in Charleston. Sadly, evil is insidious, and it spends a lifetime growing until it finally captures someone and causes irreplaceable damage to the mothers and the fathers and the children of our human family. I can only believe that mistaken understandings of faith were what kept a woman who needed to be loved and cared for from her community. Some of you suffering from chronic illness know what it must have been like for her to continually have this flow of blood for 12 long years. She undoubtedly had tried everything, been to every physician, tried every known remedy, and yet she had not been healed. And the one place where she believed she stood a chance of being made well was unavailable to her because of the beliefs and rituals of her faith. She was considered unclean, and she was unacceptable. Like so many of you who have found your way here, 
Her religion, her faith, had betrayed her when she needed them the most. How does anyone hang on to faith when they are told that because of illness, divorce, abortion, sexual orientation, gender identities, that they no longer belong? In some instances, people are denied the sacraments of the church. They can still attend. They just can't partake of the essence of their faith. For others, the only way to stay is to deny who they truly are and who they love. And for those who are bold enough to say in their conservative settings, I'm not sure I believe anymore, leaving is the only option available. All of these ways that we say who is in and who is out are done in the name of God. I don't buy it now, and I never really did. I grew up with what I consider a strong faith, and yet I was constantly arguing with those who wanted to make our faith the only way to God. When my Sunday school teachers would tell me that children across the world who had never heard of Jesus were going to hell, I would say, no, they're not. I innately knew that that was a misunderstanding of God. A God that would condemn little children was not the God of my understanding. The whole idea of hell never really made sense to me. Early on, I learned these verses from the epistles of the New Testament about God's desire that no one should perish. And I clung to those verses. So when I went to divinity school and all of my friends were having their faith crisis, I just sat back and said, yep, I knew that stuff wasn't true. Fred and Hell, though, almost got me fired from my first church as senior pastor. Our very first week at the church in Dallas, we were at a Wednesday night Bible study. Jamie Clark Soul, she's a wonderful Johannian scholar, a professor of New Testament at Perkins Divinity School. She was teaching that night, and somewhere in the middle of her teaching, she mentioned hell. And my sweet partner blurted out, hell? Nobody believes that anymore, do they? They later said the best part of that whole thing was the look on my face after he shared that opinion. Turns out that wacko liberal Baptist church didn't believe in hell either. But they did believe in the inclusive love of God. So there in the middle of Dallas, Texas, that Baptist church had a female minister, a black music director, deacons and board members who were gay and lesbian, and Jews, Muslims, and Buddhists who called that church their home. I have been so fortunate to pastor churches that believed in the love of God rather than the judgment and retribution of a God. And while I do not believe in a literal, physical hell, I do know we are capable of creating our own hell on earth. The fire of this kind of hell burns and scorches people in mosques, mosques halfway around the world and ignites terror and fear in the hearts of our friends at the mosque right around the corner. This kind of hell is enough to make you lose your religion. But what might it be like for those of us who struggle to lose our faith, our church, and find God? Death is at the center of both of the stories that Jason read to us from the gospel this morning. The physical death of a 12-year-old child and the spiritual death of a woman who was unacceptable. In both situations, death was prominent. And sometimes death is the final word. Yet sometimes there can be life from death. 
Each time we share the table of Jesus, in that meal, we remember the life, the death, and the life from death of Jesus the Christ. At funerals and memorials, I always say, we come from God, we go to God, and we are held in all space and time by God. If you have lost your faith, if you have lost your religion, if you never had any of those to begin with, there is still an opportunity to find the divine. I believe the best chance we have of finding God is in community. I believe it happens in a place like First Church where hearts are open and love is served. I believe it happens when we stand in the rain and surround the Islamic Center as they gather for Friday prayers, when fear is their present reality. I believe it happens when we show up for Shabbat services at Wilshire Temple and surround our friends with love after tragedy. I believe it happens when we decide that becoming the love of God in this city of angels is our calling. Perhaps this is the day when you will find a way to reach out and touch the divine in those who surround you. Perhaps this is the day you will let the healing powers of the divine flow through you to the ones who need to find God. Perhaps this is the day. May it be so. May it be so for all of us. Amen.